Uh, okay, um, great. Um, welcome everyone to the class. Um, so uh, a few announcements. Uh, first is that uh, we received all your homeworks and we are grading them um, uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, thank you for hard work on those. Um, gradients quizzes are getting released and I hope you are uh, solving them according to the schedule. Uh, the second and then the last thing I'd like to say is um, we sent you a Piazza message that we have a midpoint uh, quarter survey out. Um, the, the responses to the survey are, are anonymous. Please give us honest and constructive feedback so we can improve your experience in the class. So if there's anything we can do to make this class better, uh, that's a great way for you to communicate with us or just feel free to, to post or uh, send us messages. Um, and it's all anonymous, so don't worry, okay? Um, now the plan for this week is last, we are now spending two weeks talking with, on, uh, talking about graphs. Um, last last uh, time, last week, we were talking about how to find the important nodes in the graph and we were talking about page rank and random walks and so on. And what I wanna do today is I wanna talk to you about how do you do clustering on graphs, okay? So today in some sense we'll talk about clustering. And the idea is that graphs, real networks, social networks, uh, biological networks, information networks, and so on, they have non-random structure. They have, they have some latent uh, organization and structure. And our goal is to discover, extract this latent organization and structure. So uh, these uh, structures that we'd like to extract are sometimes called clusters, they can be called modules, or they can be called communities. But in all these cases, the idea is that the network can somehow be separated out in these densely connected units. And these densely connected units, as I try to show in this network, can be hierarchically nested, right? Where you say, oh, I have three big clusters, three big, let's say, communities, if this would be a social network, but then each one of them has kind of different number of different subcommunities, right? So you can have very interesting structures um, in, in this data. And our goal will be to discover this type of structure and identify what are the nodes that belong to each cluster, All right? So here's another example, and once we plot these small networks, this may seem easy, but still the question is how do we identify these densely linked uh, groups of nodes? How we, do we define the problem? What kind of um, optimization functions or criteria, objective functions do we wanna do? And then how do we solve them? That's, that's the idea. And uh, today we'll talk about uh, what is called um, non-overlapping community detection, where the idea is that you have a network and you wanna kind of find groups that don't overlap. So if this is how the graph, the network picture looks like, here is how the adjacency matrix would look like, right? So the idea is that you wanna in some, some sense sort the rows and columns of this matrix such that you find these two groups where there is a lot of edges between the members of the group right, like here and here, but very few edges across the two groups, right? So if you think these nodes here link to each other and they uh, receive this, this number of edges from this other group, right? So a network that has this type of structure will have this type of adjacency matrix. And of course, our adjacency matrix we are given is not sorted in this beautiful way, but essentially we look random to us. So this is an extremely, extremely, extremely hard problem. It's deceivingly easy when once I show you, but if I were to permute these rows to you, to your eye, it would just le look like some, some random, random stuff. And the question is, how do I discover that there is really this underlying structure? Where are these types of things happening? So for example, in web search, you can create this type of graph where you say, here are the advertisers and advertisers bid on a given set of keywords, right? So the idea is that there is an advertiser who says, I want, whenever a user searches for this, 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 and that term, I want my ad to show. So if now you can create a bipartite graph and you can say, what are the subgroups, dense regions of this graph? And for example, here is, here is a case um, from, uh, from Yahoo old, old, uh, from uh, years ago, when essentially you could say, uh -huh, all this set of advertisers tend to bid on the same set of keywords for their ads to be shown. And then you can examine and it turns out, aha, uh -huh, these are all the gambling keywords and these are the particular subset of, um, of keywords uh, that are towards uh, sports betting. So you can I identify groups or clusters of advertisers who are interested in advertising on the same thing. You can also, for example, take a look at the graph where you can say, aha, uh -huh, 
I have uh, actors to movies, right? So here are all the movies ever recorded and here are all, all the actors that uh, ever acted. And there is a dot if a given actor um, acted in a given movie. And the question is, what is the structure of this actor to movie graph? And you, if you would do that methodology we will talk about today, you would identify these clusters. And it turns out that these clusters at the first level, they correspond to different languages, right? So, you know, there are, um, or different countries, Argentinian movies, here's Mexico, Brazil, Spain, and Germany, and Italy, and so on and so forth, right? So again, we would discover this type of hidden structure in this graph data. Uh, to give you, to give you one more example, you can even do this with your own personal social networks where you could say, you know, this is me, I'm the ego, and these are my friends, um, uh, and these are connections between them. So the question would be, how is my own personal social network organized? Can I go and I identify, you know, these clusters of people that are then, of my friends who are densely connected with each other and say, aha, uh -huh, you know, these are my friends from the high school, there is a, a cluster of family members, maybe here are my college friends and, you know, people from the same department or from the same research group and so on. And again, this graph structure will allow you to make these types of uh, inferences. And here, notice that, see, that these clusters can be overlapping and they can be nested, right? So this, uh, the, the blue one is, in, is nested in the light blue one, and so on and so forth, right? So these things can be quite, quite complex. So now, um, how are we going to do this? And what are our assumptions? Our assumption will be that the graph is large, but it's um, small enough that it fits into the main memory. And if you do things correctly, then you can fit around 200 million nodes and 2 billion edges in about 16 gigabytes, uh, uh, 16 gigabytes of memory, right? So on your laptop, you should be able to process about 200 million nodes and 2 billion edges, right? Um, and now if you have a bigger server and 16 gigabytes is kind of nothing, um, we can work with much bigger graph, right? Um, and the idea is that even though, you know, you can fit the graph in your laptop, the size of the graph is so big that we cannot afford to run anything more than linear time algorithms. And what I will talk to you today about is one specific way how you can compute page rank in a very um, scalable way to be able to find dense clusters um, in the network. And the idea, what will be cool is that the runtime of the algorithm will be proportional to the cluster size, to the, to the whatever we output, and not to the graph size. So essentially, the algorithm runtime won't depend on how big the graph is, but will depend on how big of a cluster do we want to extract. So in some sense, I could run this on a, on a uh, in finite time on an infinite graph. You could think of it that way, right? So it will be super cool because it, we won't even visit parts of the graph, we'll only visit small part of the graph. And uh, here's the idea, how are we, are we going to do this? The idea will be that we'll be given a seed node and we will want to find a cluster, a community to which this seed node belongs to. So the picture to think about is I have a seed, I'm given a seed node here. So what I'd like to figure out is figure out that all these nodes belong to the same community as this seed node. Okay, so we'll be given a seed and then we want to locally explore the network around the seed and figure out what is the cluster that this seed belongs to. So that's the first thing. The way we will do this is that we will essentially run personalized page rank uh, uh, with the teleport set equal to the seed node, right? So we will start the random walker at the seed node and the random walker will, will walk around. And our intuition is that if S belongs to a good densely connected cluster, then this random walker will be trapped in here for a very long time, but when kind of the random walker gets out, it will diffuse away. Right, so we kind of expect that the random walker gets trapped in here because there's lots of connections. And then if the random walker gets very lucky, the walker can escape and then, you know, gets lost in this background. So somehow the intuition is if we start the random walk here, we'll be trapped. And then after we escape, we are gone or the random walker is gone, right? That's the, that's essentially the intuition of what we are, why, why this would work, right? Why given a seed node, and if this seed node is in a nice dense uh, cluster, the random walk will be, the random walker, the surfer will be trapped inside, but when the surfer leaves, they basically get lost in the background. So we'll be able to then identify um, uh, these blue nodes down here very easily, okay? 
So um, give, you, give you an outline. The idea is we pick some seed node of interest. We will run personalized page rank with the teleport set equals, equal to the seed node S. We will then do two more steps that are interesting. One step we will do is we will sort the nodes by the decreasing page rank score. And then we will do this sweep operation that will ident allow us to identify good clusters, okay? Now we kind of, you know, we pick a seed node. We know how to run personalized page rank. I'll tell you more how to you really do this in a super scalable way. Um, and then we want to talk about um, how then I want to sort the nodes, order them by the decreasing page ranks, personalized page rank score. And then I will want to do this sweep operation that I, I will explain in detail later, right? And this sweep operation will allow us to identify clusters. Okay, so idea is I have the seed node. Um, and the way I will do this is the following. I will, I will sort the nodes by the decreasing personalized page rank score. So PPR means personalized page rank, right? And I will somehow measure the cluster quality as I take more and more nodes from the first one to the last one into my clustering. And the idea will be that I will create this type of sweep profile plots where on the y axis I will have how good of a cluster would, would I be if I take top 10 nodes with the highest page rank score, top 20 nodes with the highest page rank score, right? So I'm asking if I take the top k nodes with the highest page rank score, how good of a cluster do I get? And lower is better. And the idea, um, the idea here is that this local minima will correspond to good clusters, okay? So for the, this particular network and that particular seed node, then this is the sweep profile. And you see it has a, um, a, a local minima here. It corresponds to this violet uh, partition, which is not that good. But then you see how we have another local minima here. And this local minima corresponds to, uh, to the green cluster, right? To the green arrow. And that, and uh, the violet arrow is, is that thing, right? So, um, and this way we can now discover the cluster that has, I don't know, 18 nodes. Yes? Why do we see like really bad scores at the very beginning? Why do we see bad scores in the beginning? Because this node has huge degree, right? So I'm basically saying what happens if I proclaim this node as its own cluster? It has a lot of edges. I will define what I mean by the cluster quality. I haven't defined that yet. I'm giving you the overview. But it will become clear once I define this. But what you need to take from this is run page rank score, sort the nodes. And then what I'm plotting here is what is the cluster quality if I take the first k, right? The first one, the first two, the first three, the first 10, the first 20, and so on. And then I get this sweep profile. And wherever I see local minima, that's the clusters I take, right? And notice that these clusters are nested in one another, right? This uh, violet cluster is nested in the green cluster, right? Because I'm taking increasingly uh, bigger sets. Now, what I have to tell you is what's the how do I measure the y-axis? So before I do that, are there any questions? So at least at high level, it should be clear what we are doing, even though we don't know what the details are. So now I'm going kind of to fill in the details. And the first detail I'll fill in is the cluster quality metric. Great. Thank you for nodding. How about this side? We feel good. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So um, great. So what's the cluster quality? Uh, the idea is the following, right? If I'm given an undirected graph, like I give you an example down there, then my goal is to divide this uh, no, uh, vertex set, the node set, into two groups, into groups A and B, and A and B are disjoint, right? So I'm saying there is A, and then B is the node set minus A. Okay, so basically all I'm saying is I want to divide my vertices into disjoint sets. And then the question is, how do I define how good is this division, right? What is a good intuitive way to say, how well do I separate the graph into two clusters? And one way to, to do this is this notion of a, uh, of a cut. Right? And in particular, what would I like to do? What's a good cluster as I mentioned before? The idea is that I want to maximize the number of within cluster connections, right? So if I'm given this little graph and I say, these are my two clusters, then I want to have as many edges between the nodes of, uh, of, the, of the cluster. And I want to minimize the number of edges that cross the cluster boundary, 
right? So I want a lot of stuff inside and I want a, a little to point out, okay? So this is what I would intuitively like. And in order for me to get this, I need to define two quantities. One is called volume and the other one is defined as cut, right? Volume is the volume and then cut is in some sense surface. And I wanna kind of um, minimize the surface to volume ratio, right? I want a fat cluster with very little surface, okay? Um, if you like this intuition. If you don't, uh, it's fine, okay? So um, how, how do I now talk about cuts, right? I wanna express cluster quality as a function of the edge cut of the cluster. And the idea is that cut is defined as a set of edges that uh, where only one node is inside, in, in cl inside the cluster, right? And if I have a weighted graph, then it would be a set of edge, uh, a sum of edge weights, right? So if I say, what is the cut of a set of nodes A? Maybe this is a set of nodes A. Then I'm summing over all the edges IJ, where one endpoint of the edge is inside the set A, and the other endpoint is outside the set A, right? So in this particular case, this would be the first edge and the second edge, and I would sum up their weights. If the graph is unweighted, then all the weights are equal to one. So the cut score of this cluster A would be equal to two. Okay, so nothing magical. I'm just saying if I decide to proclaim this as a cluster, then the cut score of the cluster is the number of edges that stick out of that cluster. Okay, and that's called the cut score. So one option would be to say, you know, you give me the graph and I will find you the set of nodes that minimizes the cut score. And hopefully I found a good cluster for you. And even though that might seem as a good idea, it turns out that on real graphs kind of, it's not too good of an idea. And I give you the corner case here, right? So the idea would be that, right, the quality of the cluster is the weight or the, uh, of the connections or number of connections pointing from the cluster to the outside. So um, the idea would be if I find the, the, the mean cut, the cluster that has the minimum cut, do I get the clustering I want? And you know, if I have the network like this, then here is the mean cut, right? I only need to cut one edge to get a cluster. But really, especially you guys at more at the back, you see that this, this graph seems to have these two clusters. You know, this thing is here, but who cares? The main division um, is here between green and uh, red nodes. So what I would really like to do is a metric that will cut here, not at this degenerate kind of easy degree one uh, node, right? So what's the problem we have, right? So our cut score is not kind of what we really want. It's good, it's nice, you can have it, you, but it's kind of not what we want, right? So what we would really, what the problem is that we only consider connections that point outside the cluster. But we do not consider anything about the internal co connectivity of the cluster. We don't, like this cut score only looks at the boundary, only looks at the boundary of the cluster, doesn't care about anything that's inside the cluster, right? So really, we need to look inside, okay? So here is a, um, a criteria now that looks inside as well. And this criteria is called conductance. And conductance is this idea of, surface to volume ratio, right? It's basically connectivity of the cluster um, uh, to the rest of the network divided by the, in some sense, the density of the cluster itself. And it has a very intuitive, intuitive definition. This may look scary, but it's actually quite simple, right? On the top, I have the cut score, right? I have number of edges IJ, where one end point of the edge is inside my set A, and one endpoint is outside the set A. So this is the cut score, right? But what I'm dividing by, I'm dividing by volume, okay? So how do I define volume? Volume of A is the total weight of the edges where that have at least one endpoint in A. So it's a, basically it's volume of a given set of nodes is a sum over the nodes in that set um, and you sum up their degrees, okay? So, um, and I take this ratio. So another way to think of the volume, volume is simply two times number of edges between the members of the cluster plus the number of edges pointing outside the cluster. Why do I have two times here? Because I sum up degrees 
And then if the edge is inside the cluster, then both endpoints get counted, get counted twice, right? That's why there is a two here. And of course, this, these guys get counted only once because it's only one endpoint of the edge that is inside the cluster, okay? Uh, that's the reason for this formula. But essentially what this is doing, it's saying how many edges point outside versus how many edges do I get inside, okay? And then one more thing to say here is that why do I have this minimum and, and, and so on? And the reason why I, I have this is purely technical. Basically, the reason why I do this is we want a good cluster to be such where this A is uh, as small as possible. And if I wouldn't have, sorry, this phi conductance is as small as possible. And if I wouldn't have this minimum, then basically the point is the following. If I go back to my previous example, I could proclaim all this to be my cluster A, and I would have huge volume and very small cut. So that's why I take the volume of the smaller side, right? What I'm saying here is take the volume of the smaller side. And because I take the volume of the smaller of the two sides, I kind of want to discover clusters that are of about equal size, that are partitions that are balanced, that have kind of equal mass, right? This is just saying take the smaller of the two. So if one is big, then the other one will be smaller. Because m is the number of edges, sum of all degrees is two times number of edges because every edge gets tw counted twice if you think about it. So it's volume of A, 2m minus volume of A. And I take the bigger, uh, sorry, the smaller of the two. Okay, so um, why is this criterion called conductance good? Because it produces balanced partitions, okay? Um, great, and uh, to give you an example, and then I can take some questions, is uh, the following. I have the same graph twice. Imagine uh, the red nodes are my set A, so I say I'll cut up there. If I would ask what's the conductance of that cut, is 0.5, because I need to cut two edges. Right, if you go up there, right, two edges, what is the sum of the degrees is three plus one is four, so it's 0.5. Now, if I say, how about this cut? Um, I need to cut here um, six edges, you can count them. And then, you know, you can say, what is the sum of the degrees of these red nodes? It's 92, so six over 92 is point, point, point 0.06. So this is a much better cut, a much lower conductance much uh, better cluster than this cluster. Even though here we cut two edges and here we have to cut six, but here we get 92 edges kind of inside the cluster versus only getting four edges inside the cluster, okay? So uh, that's essentially the idea. And just to, to go back and, and drive this, why do I take the minimum here? Because if I wouldn't have that minimum, then I could make this to be a huge, very good conductance if I would color all the blue nodes red and the, the red ones blue. Then I would have huge volume for very little cut. I would have two times number of edges in here and then that would be super small and it would look great, but it's useless, right? So that's why I need to take the smaller volume of the two sides. Um, good, now it's time to ask me questions. Everyone still happy? Yes, great. Can you repeat the intuition behind like 2m minus? Yes, so, so what is this, you mean this thing? Yeah, great, okay, so this is volume, right? It's the sum of the degrees of the nodes in A. If you say, what is the total sum of the degrees in the entire network, that is two times number of edges. Why is that? Because for, right, imagine you have two nodes and one edge then this edge gets counted twice because you have the degree of this guy and degree of that guy. So it's one plus one. So both endpoints get counted, okay? So that's why the sum of the degrees is two times number of edges, right? So the, so the total volume of the entire graph is two times number of edges. So this is the volume of the left side. So this is now the volume of the right side. And I take the minimum of the two. And the reason I wanna take the minimum is if I go here, you know, this is left and that is right. If I divide by the minimum volume, I divide by the volume of this small thing, which is four. So, but the volume of this side is huge. So if I would flip what left and right is, I could have, have, I could get a very good conductance score, something that has very low value, but it's not what I want. It's useless, it's cheating. So that's why I take the smallest thing. 
Great, thank you for the question. Good, anything else? Everyone happy? Yes? Okay. Right. Good, so now we know how to measure quality of the cluster. So now let me tell you um, how this sweep operation works, right? So the outline of our algorithm is pick a, s a seed node S, run a personalized page rank with teleport set equals to this seed node S, sort the nodes by the decreasing page rank score, and then you do this sweep over the nodes to find good clusters. And the way the sweep will work is, uh, opa, the following. As I said, I want to sort the nodes such that the first node here has the highest page rank score, second highest, and so on. And then I want to compute for every i what is the conductance of the set a sub i, where in a sub i I put the first i nodes into my set, right? So in some sense, I start at the starting node, and now I know then I keep adding nodes uh, together to it. And for every node that I add into the cluster, I compute the conductance. And whatever are the local minima in the conductance of that set a sub i, that's a good cluster. So what I'm plotting here is conductance of a sub i as a function of i, where i is the rank. Yes? Good, is it clear what I mean? Right, so I'm just sorting my nodes and I take the first i nodes and proclaim them as, a, as my cluster and I ask what is the conductance. And if I find a good cluster, then I need to have a local minima, right? I need something where the conductance of that set is really good, very low, but as I try to expand it, it increases, right? So it means I kind of crossed the cluster boundary. That's the intuition. Yes, great. Uh, my assumption is that as you include more and more nodes, the cluster is likely not as good. So for example, like by 50, you have something that seems lower than at 20. So how would you decide between the size of the clusters? Great question. So the point is, I didn't say global minima, I said local minima. So you are searching for kinks, right? So you want, you want a kink like that, right? Or a, or a kink like that. So how would, you, how would you do this? There are several strategies. One strategy is that you come up with some heuristic that tries to detect when you have local minima. Another thing people do is just take the first local minima. That's a, you know, that's, that, that depends a bit. But the idea is that you want to search come up with some heuristic, some method that identifies this local minima. And the things that are here, you shouldn't trust too much, and I will explain why you shouldn't trust them too much. Okay, yes, great. Uh, so does that mean that conductance, uh, like, in and of itself is not a good measure of a cluster if you can't just take the global minimum? You could take the global minimum if, if this would be computed perfectly, but the method I'll explain actually has more error here to the right. So it will become clear why you cannot trust things further out. Okay, but good, good points. I should have said that. Good, awesome, happy, yes, good, great. So uh, super, what is one important thing? One important thing that may not be obvious is that this sweep uh, profile, this curve, can be computed in linear time. So it's in one step, in one pass, you can compute the entire curve. And the way why this works is because basically what you do is the following, right? You loop over the nodes and you keep a hash table of the nodes that are, that are in your cluster I right now. And then when you say, what is, the com what is the conductance of the cluster that has, you know, the first I nodes plus one more, then you need to compute what is the cut of the uh, set uh, a sub i plus one divided by the volume. And the way you can do this is that if you know what was the volume of the set before, now you added one node to the set. So you just need to add the degree of that node and that's your new volume, right? Because your cluster is only growing. You're just adding one more node uh, to the cluster and here is its degree and that means you have computed the volume, right? So updating the volume is simple. How about updating the cut? Updating the cut is also easy. The way you compute the, uh, update the cut is to say, whatever was the number of edges I cut, I had to cut before, plus the degree of this node that I add in now, and then you have minus two times number of edges 
from this node um, i plus one back to the set a sub i, right? Um, so the way to understand this is to say whatever was the cut score before, now I add one uh, node inside my cluster. This node has D connections, right? So I know I will have to cut some of these. Which ones won't I have to cut? The ones that point to the members of the, of the, of the cluster that I had before, right? And this way, again, you very simply updated your cut score. And now your updated conductance is just cut divided by volume, okay? Because, and the reason why this works is because at every step, we are basically growing this set A by one node. We are throw it in, it's clear how to update um, volume, and this is how you update the cut. And you can now work out the entire, the entire uh, sweep curve in one pass uh, over, uh, over the nodes. And the only thing you have to do is for that, for the node that you threw in the set A, you have to ask how many edges of it point back to other nodes of the, of the previous, uh, of the previous set, right? And that's it. Okay, so now we should be able to, 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 to do this and to, uh, and to compute this, okay? So, um, are there any questions so far? Yes? Uh, will you also check for the minimum in the volume, like, uh, um, great. Why do you check for minimum? Usually, you would compute the entire, um, the entire thing, and usually your the clusters you care about are much smaller than s half of the graph, so you don't even that that minimum never really happens in practice because you think of this set A to be relatively small. I don't know, maybe thousand nodes out of a billion, right? So you'll never compute this out out to half a billion. You, you care about finding small dense clusters and usually those are relatively small compared to the entire graph. So in, in practice that minimum between volume of A and uh, volume of not A, nev you never really care about it. But it's a good point. You would need to consider for that if this is really done on the entire graph. Great point, thank you. Yes? Is there any computing of time Great, super question, he just asked it and I said no. And the reason I say you don't need to do that is because you can think of the set A to be small compared to the entire graph. So you never flip over beyond half of the graph or half of the volume of the graph, right? If you think of a graph of a billion nodes, then this set A would have to be kind of half a billion before the, before the volume on the other side uh, becomes smaller. So, so you don't need that. But in principle, yes, in practice, no. All right, thank you again for the question. Good. So now what I want to do is um, answer the question is how do we compute this uh, page rank, right? How do we compute personalized page rank without touching the entire graph, right? Because what do we know so far? How you would compute this so far would be given the teleport set S, you would create the teleport vector, let's call it A, that has all zeros but, you know, uh, value one at the index of the node S. And then, you know, R would now be the personalized page rank vector and you would iterate this equation that I showed you here. This is exactly what we learned last, uh, last week, right? Um, and you could do this, but it would take some time. It would take about 50 iterations before this is done. And here, notice that M is that page rank matrix, the stochastic matrix we talked about. So it means you have to touch the entire graph 50 times to compute this uh, rank vector R. So what we will do is we will today learn about how to approximately compute the page rank score. And this will be a fast method for computing approximate page rank score with teleport set S. And the way we will, the notation will be is that we'll have this function approximate page rank that will take the seed node, it will take beta the teleportation parameter, and it will take in the parameter epsilon that will tell us how, how much error do we tolerate in the page rank scores of nodes that are computed, right? And uh, this is what we will do. So here is now an overview how will this look like. So first thing is we will consider a bit different version of the random walk we talked about so far, and this is called a lazy random walk. And the reason this is called a lazy random walk because it's a variant of a random walk where the random walk stays put at a given node with probability one half, and with the remaining probability walks uh, to the neighbor. So here would be the recursive equation for the, for the lazy random walk, right? So I'm saying where is the random walker at the next time step? 
with probability half, the walker stays where the walker is. And with another probability, the, uh, with the remaining probability, the walker uh, makes, uh, makes a step, right? So from, so basically I'm saying my page rank score at the next time step is my current page rank score because the walker did not move or wa walker was one of my, uh, one of my, at one of my neighbors and it, and the walker navigated back to me to the node u. So this is now a bit different version uh, of the random walk. And now what we will do for this particular version of the random walk, there is another key concept for us to keep in mind is this notion of defining residual personalized page rank score and we'll call it Q. And this residual page rank score will be the, the difference between the true score of the node versus the current estimate of the score of the node, right? So this is the estimate of the page rank score of node u at time t and this is the true page rank score of the node u. So this difference is what we'll call residual page rank score, right? It's in some sense error. It's, uh, it's, the esti it's the error in our estimate of the page rank score. This is our estimate, that's the truth, the difference is the error, okay? So uh, P sub u is the true page rank, uh, R sub u is the page rank estimate that we have computed right now at time t, and then the, I, the, the idea is the following, if the residual uh, uh, um, uh, uh, page rank score of a given node, node is too big, meaning if the residual divided by the degree is greater than epsilon, then in some sense we want to push the random walk further. We want to take some of our error, our residual, and distribute it to some of, uh, uh, to our neighbors so that uh, our residual goes down, right? So the idea is that every node will keep track of this residual score, and if the node will say, oh, my rank is not accurate enough, what it will do is it will push some of this residual away, it will get rid of its own error, and uh, this way it will improve its estimate. And we will keep doing this until every node, every node's error is below epsilon. And once everyone's node, every, every node's error is below, below epsilon, every node will be happy, right? And because we are only pushing this further, and nodes that are very far will have tiny page rank scores, by definition, their errors will be less than epsilon, so we won't even push it that far, okay? So that's the intuition. So the idea is that every node has this residual score that says, what is the error in my estimate of page rank? How, how, how much more important do people think I am than I really am? And, and if my residual is too big, I'm like, I wanna get rid of it so that I'm more confident about my score. And as, as we get rid of it, in some sense, this residual be, will be pushed further in the graph and kind of the random walker will walk a step further. That's the idea. So with this intuition, let me now make things a bit more mathematically precise. Are there any questions before I do that? Yes? How exactly do you compute Q since we obviously don't have P because otherwise we wouldn't need to do this? Awesome, how do I compute Q? Um, I will show you in two slides, yes. Definitely I'll show you. Otherwise, yes, you would be on, yeah, I will show you. Good, all right, good. So uh, here is one way, one other way how to think about page rank. Um, and this is a very different way how we thought about it so far. So this is not a recursive equation, but what this is really saying, it's, it's basically, it says that page rank in some sense is linear. So what is this equation trying to say is the following. Let P sub beta of A be the true page rank vector with the teleport parameter beta and the uh, uh, teleport vector uh, A. Okay, so this is the, the page rank, uh, in some sense, this is the page rank function that given the graph, given beta and A, returns me a vector of page rank scores. And then what I can do is the following. I can write this out in the following way. I can say that this true vector of page rank score equals one minus beta uh, teleport vector times beta uh, plus beta times page rank score of the teleport vector that is M times A, okay? So let's try to digest what does this mean? So on the left hand side, we have the true page rank vector uh, with the teleport parameter beta and the teleport vector A. On the right hand side, this beta times P sub beta M times A, what is this? This is the page rank vector with the teleportation vector M times A. 
and a teleportation parameter beta, right? So M here is our uh, stochastic page rank transition matrix. And what is M times A? It's a single step of the random walk, right? If the random walker starts here by multiplying it with M, it's essentially one step of the random walk. So what we are really saying is that the, that the page rank score when the walker starts at A equals one minus beta times A plus beta times the page rank score distribution after the random walker has made then one step and then does the rest, okay? That's, that's what this is saying. And uh, here is how we can prove this. And the way we can break this out is the following. We can break the, the, the page rank score into two cases. We can say, what if the walk, uh, walk is of length one and what, oh, sorry, of length zero, and what if the walk is of length more than zero? Right? The probability that the walk is of length zero is one minus beta, right? So the idea is I'm at the starting po uh, node and I ask myself, do I wanna take a step and I wanna teleport? I say I will teleport. So I teleport myself into one minus beta and where do I end? I end where I am. So this is the first case, right? For the walk to be of length beta, we wanna, uh, of length zero, we wanna teleport immediately. So that happens with probability one minus beta. And the, you know, the walk ends where it started. So the, the walker distribution is exactly where it started. It's the vector A. Yes? Why do we say we, when we teleport, we teleport back to where we were? Are we assuming the teleport set is just a seed node? Doesn't matter. <laughs> Even if this is a probability distribution, I teleport back where I was. If I immediately teleport, it's exactly where I was. Whatever was your belief of where I started, if I start according to this distribution, and then I teleport again, your belief about where I am is exactly as it was. So that's what this is. So this works for any, any vector A, okay? Then um, uh, now how about the other case when the walk has length more than zero, right? This happens with probability beta, with the remaining probability, right? And then, you know, uh, then what this mean? Then this means that walk starts with, with the distribution A, starts, uh, its starting point is according to this ve um, teleport vector A, takes a step. So now that it took a step, it has a distribution M times A, right? So A is where we started, M is the transition matrix. So M times A executes one step of the random walk, okay? So this is now our belief where the random walker is after one step. Right? And then the idea is now that I know where the walker is after one step, I can take the rest of the random walks by applying my page rank operator, right? Which is, this is now my, in some sense, the rest of the random walk, and this is my uh, page rank operator, right? And what did we use here to make this argument work? work? We use this notion of memory, memoryless, memorylessness of the random walk. And memorylessness, in, this is um, in Markov chain theory. Basically, it tells us that random walk is a first order Markov chain. So it doesn't care where it came from, just once it is, it makes a decision, right? And this means memorylessness. You, do, you forget where you came from. And the random walk, this first order random walk, the page rank random walk, doesn't remember where it, uh, where it came from. And because of this argument, the above equation is correct. So now, that, that we have this intuition where essentially know how we can compute page rank uh, by executing one step of the random walker and then, you know, the, the same operator takes care of the rest. We can now define this notion of a push operator. And here is the push operator. This is all done with the hope that we'll be able to compute approximately page rank, right? The idea is let R be our approximate page rank vector, Q is the residual vector, and we will start with a trivial approximation. We will say all the nodes have, have page rank score zero and our residual vector is A, okay? Um, so this is the residual for every node. And then the idea is that now we wanna iteratively push page rank from the residual to R until the residual is small enough. And uh, here is the math for the push operator. And basically we are saying, Take some, uh, you are right now at node uh, U, here is the page rank vector, here are the residuals, what will you do? You take the residual of, um, of node U, multiplied by one minus beta, and you add that 
to the to the to your estimate of the page rank score of node u, right? So this is my previous estimate. Now this is the probability of teleportation, and uh, I take part part of the residual and store it at the node itself, and the rest of the residual I will move forward, right? Like half of the residual I will store at the node itself, so I have one half beta times the residual of node u, and then for every v node v that node u points to, I'm now taking v's residual and I send some of u's residual to the node v. Okay, so here I'm saying I will take uh, this one half beta times residual of u, I divide that by the degree of node, the out degree of node u, and every of the neighbors v gets one over the degree of that residual score, right? So what, what did I do with this one simple step? I decreased the residual of node u itself. I took some of it and saved it into my estimate of the page rank score of node u, and the other half of the residual I pushed out to the neighbors of u. And now, because of this, some of the residuals of the neighbors v might get too big, so they will wake up and they will further push out this uh, residual score, and we will iterate this push, push operator until all the residuals are small enough, okay? So here is the, here is the intuition behind the push operator, right? The idea is that I have a node that has large residual. So this means we have a, we have underestimated the importance of node u, right? Then what do we want to do? We want to take some of that residual and give it away since we know that we have, that the node u has too much of it, right? So that's the first thing. We want to push some of it out to the neighbors, right? So the way we will do this is we will keep half of the residual um, to, um, uh, uh, and uh, give, and uh, so this is half we keep, and the other half we give away to the neighbors so that they can then in turn get rid of it. And this way their estimates will be more, uh, will be, will be uh, more accurate. And this corresponds to uh, uh, this part of our equation where we are sharing, basically taking our re residual and offloading it to our neighbors v. That happens here. And uh, basically the idea is that each node keeps, wants to keep giving away its excess page rank, its residual, until all the nodes have no or very, very small gap in the excess page rank, in their page rank residual. And that's essentially the algorithm, right? So to give you the pseudocode, here is a very simple pseudocode. The idea is while the residual of a given, no of, of any node divided by their degree is greater than epsilon, then uh, take that node and execute a push operation. And you keep executing push operation until every, uh, every node's residual is, uh, is uh, divided by its out degree is less than epsilon, right? And because this push operator just goes from node u and pushes one step out, you will, this operation will finish uh, depending on the value of epsilon uh, very soon and it won't touch parts of the graph that are very far away, right? And that's essentially the intuition how you do this. And this can run super, super, super fast, okay? Because it's all local and it's all about pushing these residuals over the edges. And now, of course, if I set epsilon to be super small, essentially I could compute the page rank scores of all the nodes. But if my epsilon is relatively large, then if I tolerate kind of relatively large errors, I will, I will um, only propagate this push operator very locally in the graph, okay? And of course, you have to understand that in the graph, the page rank score will kind of decay as I go farther out from the starting node, right? So really, the epsilon will, will, will create kind of a border and we won't push the, the page rank score too far in the graph, okay? Uh, good, let me now give you two observations and then I'll give you some examples, right? So observation is the following, that this algorithm, it's called page rank nibble, computes the personalized page rank score in time that is constant with respect to the size of the graph. It, time is one over uh, epsilon times one minus beta, right? So epsilon is our uh, error tolerance, the, um, and uh, um, the beta is the teleport parameter. 
And this is better than the power iteration that would compute the personalized pagering scores in time log n. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that there is actually an approximation guarantee that says there exists a, if there exists a cut of conductance um, uh, phi and volume uh, k in the graph, then our method will find a cut that is, that is a quadratic factor away from the optimal cut. Okay, so we know that this local minima finding, um, finding uh, method will actually find something that is very close uh, to the optimal. Uh, here's the paper from which this is taken, um, and there is also code available. Now, I want to give you one example to see, to, for you to see how this works, right? So based on the value of epsilon, the random walk, the, the page rank will be pushed farther and farther in the graph. So here I have my graph, and this is the seed node I chose. And what I show you here is the sweep curves for different values of epsilon, right? My error tolerance. And when I pick a big epsilon, I get the, the, the violet curve. Right? The page rank gets pushed only up to the node 18, and then all the nodes have a residual page rank less than epsilon, so the procedure stops. So I only push it limited amount. Now I decrease epsilon and I rerun my algorithm. And as I decrease epsilon and I run it further, I get the blue curve. Okay? Notice how the blue curve kind of takes the, the violet one and then continues it. And notice that here they diverge, so it means that these page rank scores I shouldn't really be trusting because I had a very big er um, error parameter, epsilon, right? So I get the blue one. Now I further tweak the epsilon to be even smaller, rerun the algorithm, now my page rank, sc page rank score gets pushed up to here, almost up to node 60. And I can make the epsilon even smaller and it gets pushed out even further. Right, so essentially what I'm trying to say is, depending on how big cluster do I want to extract, I may set the value of epsilon and uh, the page rank score gets pushed farther and farther out. And you guys were telling me before, why don't you take the global, uh, the global minima of this curve? Is because the last part of the page rank score, I don't really trust because this is where the error is the largest. Right, so I wouldn't want to, interpret this in any way because this is just noise, right? While you see how here basically all the curves follow, follow one another, right? Like the blue one, sorry, the, the yellow, the, the violet one is accurate till here and then diverges. Then you see how blue one follows it exactly and goes this way. And then the green, green one follows the blue one exactly, but this is where the blue one diverged and really this is the right way to go. And then you see how blue and um, green and red follow each other, and then this is where the green gets crazy, but the, the page, the, when I even decrease the epsilon, this is the true curve. And then again, you know, somewhere here it must get um, um, un, um, un, um, unstable or un, in, inaccurate, right? So now for this node, you know, what would be the cluster we would find? It would probably be this cluster. And this is, you know, after exactly five nodes, so we would say, cut here, right? And then the second cut we would find would be somewhere here at around 20, and that would likely be somewhere here, right? And, and so on and so forth, right? So basically the idea is that as I tweak epsilon, I push this random walk farther and farther out, where the last part of the curve I don't trust because the error there is too big. That's the idea. Um, this is one way to explain this. Another way to explain this is to say this is now on a huge graph where this is now the sweep curve where uh, here is the, here is the, uh, the nodes and these are now the, the I think, um, 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 nodes, nodes ordered by, by, the, by the page rank score. Um, and you see, how, and then the solid curve is the, the fully computed personalized page rank vector and here is the approximate page rank vector. And the idea is that the approximate traces, traces the truth for some time, but then diverges. So we kind of trust it in the first part. And now if I would make epsilon even smaller, then the dotted line would follow the, 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 the solid line longer, and then again it would diverge. So I can 
push PageRank as far as I want, and the farther I push it, the more I have to pay for it, right? The more push operations I have to do. Um, good. So this is what I wanted to say here. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh -huh. How do you select the seed set? You have several options. One option is that you select seed set at random. Uh, the other thing is many times the seed set is given to you. Because you say, I have this node, what cluster does it belong to? Who are other nodes that belong to the same cluster? So many times the seed set will be given to you. You can pick it at random, right? And then you could say, if I go back, opa, if I go back, right? If I see a good local minima, I say, oh, this node is part of the cluster. If I don't see any good local minima, I say, this node is just part of noise, I will do nothing with it. Okay, but this is kind of this local clustering method that allows you to extract one cluster at a time. Thank you for the question. Good, anything else? So let's uh, do this. Here's the summary. The algorithm is simple, four step, picks the seed node of interest, run the page rank, either personalized page rank, either the um, basically run the page rank nibble as we discussed, sort the nodes by the decreasing page rank score, run the sweep over the nodes to compute the conductance, find the local minima, that's your, um, that's your, um, that's your, uh, the, and, and this way you discover the clusters. Let me now, because I'm running a bit, where do you guys see my, maybe I'll just do this. I'll skip this, it doesn't matter, it's super cool. But I will show you now the second way how to do community detection, and this is another uh, very scalable methods in the, in the last uh, uh, 20 minutes. So here is the idea. The idea is that I want to go and identify tightly connected sets of nodes, right? We still have this type of picture. And what we thought about so far is if I give you a seed node, you will discover this cluster. Now, what I wanna do is, I don't wanna do this through seed nodes, but I wanna directly discover the clusters. And the way I will do this is the following. I will define this notion of modularity, which is in some sense a similar co concept to conductance. It tries to measure the, the quality of the cluster, but um, it, is, um, it, is, uh, uh, it is based on a different intuition. And the way this modularity function Q is defined, it measures how well can a network be partitioned into communities? So this is not to say for one cluster how good the cluster is, but it is for an entire set of clusters, how good is this clustering for the entire network? And the idea is that given a partitioning of the network into groups or clusters capital S, then we say that modularity is the sum over the groups, number of edges within the group minus the expected number of edges between the group. Okay, so what does this mean is, it basically says, what is the difference between how many edges I get between the members of the group versus how many edges would I expect? And if this distance is big, then I'm like, wow, I'm really surprised about how well this set of nodes is connected. Now, what do we need to be able to do this? We need to come up with a null model. We need to say, how do I compute the expected number of edges within a, a, a group of nodes. So let's first work out what is the expected number of edges within, within the group uh, S. So here is how you do this. The model we will use is called the configuration model. And the idea is the following. I'm given a real graph on N nodes and M edges, and I will create what is called a rewired network G prime. And the way I will um, create this rewired network is that I will create nodes and nodes will have these spokes, right? So essentially I take all the edges and I cut them in half. So every node has a set of spokes, right? These are the edges that it has ready for the two spokes to be connected, right? And I will consider this uh, as a multigraph where essentially now I wanna take random endpoints of spokes and connect them. And this way I will have a graph. What is a multigraph? A multigraph is a normal graph where I allow multiple edges between a pair of nodes. Then you could ask, what is the expected number of edges between nodes I and J? The expected number of nodes between I and J, uh, between, between, the expected number of edges between nodes I and J is degree of node I 
times degree of node j divided by twice the number of edges. Why is that? Here is how you can think about this, right? Case, k, node i has k spokes, and now you are say, okay, for each of these spokes, I'm going to connect it uh, with another random spoke. Node j has j, k sub j spokes. What is the total number of spokes in the graph is two times number of edges, right? Again, every edge is cut in half, so I get however edges there are, there are two times um, uh, that number of spokes. So node j has k sub j divided by 2m fraction of all the spokes. If node i now has i tries to connect, the expected number of times it will connect to node j is k sub i times k sub j divided by two times number of edges. And that's the expected number of links of edges we, we, see, we expect to see in this multigraph between nodes uh, i and j where i has degree k, k sub i and j has degree k sub j, okay? Um, and as I said, the, the null model is called the configuration model. And the idea is essentially we take the graph, we cut the edges in half, and then we randomly connect the, the endpoints of spokes. Why is this good? Because this is an essentially a model that says I will have the same degree distribution. Nodes will keep their number of edges, but I will connect edges at random. So that's why this is also called edge rewiring, right? Everyone keeps the same number of friends, but the edges now go at random, okay? Good, good. So now, uh, now I want to compute modularity. This is the formula I gave you before. The modularity score Q goes over a set of clusters. And for every cluster, we say how many edges are between the members of the cluster S minus the expected number of edges between the members uh, of the cluster S. How would I write this out? I can write it this way. I say this is a sum over all the groups. Uh, a sum over all the pairs of nodes i, i and j that are member of the group. This now just counts how many edges are between all the members, right? This is the adjacency matrix, it's zero, one. So if there's an edge between i and j, this is one, otherwise it's zero. So this will just count how many edges are between any i and j inside s. And then what this thing is doing, what is the expected number of edges between nodes i and j? So summing this up tells me how is, what is the true number of edges inside the group. This is what is the expected number of edges inside the group, right? It's between all pairs of nodes inside the group, whether there is a true edge versus how many edges would we expect. And by summing this, you get the difference um, above, right? So, and the other thing is this two times m is simply a normalizing constant so that modularity q has value between minus one and one. Okay, um, to explain, modularity will take value between minus one and one. It is, it will take a positive value if the number of um, edges within the group exceeds the expectation, and it will take a value less than one if a given group is less connected than what we, uh, less than zero. So modularity would take value less than zero if the group is less connected than what we would expect under this random model. Generally, people say if your modularity is around 0 0.3, 0 0.7, this means you have a very good, very pronounced modularity structure. Of course, higher modularity is better, but if modularity is somewhere here, we are happy with the clustering, okay? Um, so that is great. So I wanna see if people have any questions about the blue formula. Right, so what we did is we defined the null model. Based on the null model, we computed the expected number of edges between a pair of nodes. And now we are going over all, all pairs of nodes in a given cluster. Aij, the sum of that will simply be the total number of edges between the members of the cluster. And that Kikj will be the uh, expected number of edges between all the members of the cluster. And the difference between the two is our modularity score, right? Um, that's, that's what I wanted to say. So now what is our goal? Our goal is to find partitioning S, capital S, so that Q gets maximized. That's our goal, right? This is what we uh, want to achieve. Um, are there any questions? That's right.
No questions. That side is tired. Okay, good. Maybe I continue. So, um, so now what should be clear is the modularity function and uh, um, what do I want to do now? I want to find this capital S such that modularity function has a high value, right? I want the number of edges between the members of clusters to be much number than the what is my expected number of edges under this random null model where edges are flying around at random. Okay, that's the, that's the idea. So there is a heuristic method to do this that is named after a, a very nice uh, uh, university and town in, in Belgium called the Leuven method. Um, um, let me now tell you how this Leuven method works. So this will be a greedy community detection algorithm that will have runtime of n log n where n is the number of nodes in the graph. It will support weighted networks and it will give us a hierarchical decomposition, almost like the same way as hierarchical clustering, agglomerative clustering we talked about uh, will allow us to do. And this is the most popular community detection method to study networks. The reason because it's fast, it converges quickly, um, and it gives you quite good communities. So now how does this work? This is a greedy approach that maximizes modularity. And each pass has two phases. In the phase one, we will greedily optimize modularity by making local changes to communities. So essentially we'll ask every node, hey, do you want to change your class, uh, your community memberships? And nodes will be allowed to switch. After the nodes have, uh, have each node greedily decided how they want to switch, we will then go and identify the communities. And then we will create these communities and out of them we will create super nodes and we'll kind of coarsen the network, and then we will apply the, the, same, the same two phases on the coarsened network. So the idea is I'm given my raw network, I find the communities here indicated by colors, I will contract each community into a super node, and I will create a super node network, and now I will apply community detection to this super node network again to identify communities, contract super nodes to be super super nodes, create the super super network, and so on. Okay, that's the, that's the idea. This is a little picture, I'll explain it more later. And I'll fill in the details, right? The idea is that you keep repeating these passes until no increase in modularity is possible, or until you created your super 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 network with only one node, where you contra contracted everything. Right? And this now shows you the hierarchical decomposition where you say, aha, uh -huh, I have these two groups that split into four, and these four groups split into this way. So you get this kind of hierarchical decomposition. Now we need to talk about uh, phase one and phase two. So here is uh, phase one. Phase one starts the following. You put each node in the graph in, in its own community. You say each node is its own cluster. And then for every node i, the algorithm performs two, two, two calculations. You compute what is called the modularity gain. If you take node i um, from its current community and you put it into the community of some neighbor j. Right, so essentially you take a node and say, hey node, what if you join your neighbor j into their community? How would that increase modularity? And you get the, the score. And then you say, okay, I'll take the second neighbor and ask politely my node i, hey, what if you join this other neighbor? What would this do to the modularity? And you do this for every neighbor of node, uh, of node i, and then at the end you move node i to the community that yields the largest uh, modularity gain. And this loop continues until no one, no, no, no yield is given, right? Where every node is happy where they are. There are two things uh, to note here. This loop over all the nodes where every node you ask, hey, what if you move to your neighbor's community? Will that help or not? You keep running this until it stops. So this means you will find some local maxima of the modularity function. And then the second thing is that wherever you get stuck, whatever is the local maxima, that, that, that will depend on the order in which you are examining your nodes. And that's okay. So people have found that the order doesn't make too much difference. So you pick some random order and, and do it in that way and you don't worry too much. But this is a local greedy algorithm that gets stuck. Uh, where you get stuck is 
depending on the order of nodes. Then what is, uh, what is another important thing? Here I show this big equation, but essentially it's very cheap to compute. Modularity has this nice property that it's easy to compute what would be the modularity gain if I move node i to community c. And essentially you can just, you just need a couple of sufficient statistics, which is the, the sum of link weights between nodes in the existing cluster C, sum of all link weights of all the nodes in the cluster C, and then you also need this ki in and ki, which is the sum of link weights between node i and cluster C, and uh, sum of all link weights of node i, right? So essentially when you decide to, to move the node, all you have to compute is k sub i in. This is clear, you can pre-compute that, this is, this is what you already have, this is also what you already have. So the only thing you have to do is look at, if you are thinking of taking node i and moving it into community c, you have to say how many edges are there between i and c. And you can compute the, the delta in modularity according, uh, accol according to, uh, uh, to, this, to this metric, right? And um, this is now, what happens if you take i and put it into community c? Another thing you have to compute, which is a very similar formula, what happens because right now node i is in some community d, so you take i out of d and stick it into c. So there will be a modularity delta because you took i and put it into c, and there will be some modularity delta because you took i and took it outside of d to put it into c. So you have to also compute this guy, but the formula is very similar. And again, the point is that this can be done in time that is linear in the number of edges of the node, so it can be done super fast. So that's the, the greedy optimization. Now, in the second step, we have to create, in the second, um, uh, 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 or, uh, in the second phase of our algorithm, we have to create the, the super network. And here is how the super network is created. So super network has super nodes. So the idea is that for every cluster, you contract all the members of that community of that cluster into a single super node. Um, and then, right, so super node, and then you have to create edges of the super uh, network. And the way you create edges of the super network is that you say two super nodes are connected. If there is at least one edge between the nodes of one cluster, pointing to the any node in the other cluster. And now these two super nodes are connected. And then the weight of the connection between the two super nodes is the, in some sense, the number of edges or the, the sum of the ed edge weights between any node in one cluster that points to any node in the other cluster, right? Um, and this now creates the super network, okay? So it should be quite intuitive. I take all the members of the cluster and merge them into a super node. Uh, and then the edge between the super nodes has the weight that counts how many edges go between the two corresponding clusters. And that's it, okay? And I get now a weighted network. Um, and now that I have a weighted network, I can apply phase one again on this super, super weighted network, right? And I can keep running this until, until, it, uh, until it converges. So um, the way, the way this, this will work, is if I'm given, for example, this network, I would ask a given node, for example, here node zero, and I ask it, okay, what would happen if I, if I, um, if I move this node into the community of node two, uh, node five, or node three, and so on. And here would be uh, the, 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 the calculations, what happens if I, if I move the node uh, zero, and I would then greedily, de greedily decide where to move it. And I would ask every node in this network to locally move it around, and I would keep doing until no node would mo want to move. So it means when modularity delta would stop inc increasing. And after the first iteration, here is the, here is the community structure I would get, right? So every color is a different cluster, is a different community. Notice that there are four, cl four clusters. So now that my uh, phase one of the first step is done, now I have to, or the first pass, now what I have to do is create a super network. 
right? Given that are four colors left, I create a super network on four edges. And then, for example, um, I can now ask um, what is the, uh, the, the edge weight between, um, um, between the, the, the nodes of the super network. So for example, green and violet, there is an one edge between them. So there is, a, there is an edge of uh, weight one here between green and violet, right? But for example, the green nodes should have 16 edges between themselves. So the weight here is 16. You know, these guys have 14 edges between themselves, so it should be 14. There should be one edge between the two, and this is my now, my new network. So then I would say in the second phase, I start with this new network. I do the greedy modularity optimization, and I would converge to something like this, right? So these two green nodes belong to one community, and these two pink nodes belong to the, to the second community. So now again, I would join these two together. So my new network would be the, 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 um, the self loop would be 16 plus 2 plus 3 would be um, huh, 26, okay. Maybe I didn't compute that correctly. But um, the, the number of edges across is 1 to 3. So this weight would be um, 1 to 3. Um, yes, okay. So, um, and that, this is how this would work, and I would keep doing this until this network would collapse into a single node. And now I have a hierarchical decomposition where essentially I would say my network is composed of four clusters where those four are then merged in such a way that blue and green merge together and uh, orange and violet merge together. Um, and then at the last level, um, the, the, the new pink and green uh, merge into the, into, the same, into the same cluster. So this is how this method would work, and it's essentially a greedy method where you ask every node, do you want to change your cluster? And then you have this uh, uh, fast modularity update um, uh, function that you can call. After you are done updating, you create the super network and apply the algorithm on this um, super network weighted network. Notice that this modularity function is defined over a weighted network where rather than summing the, the number of links, you are summing the link weights and everything still um, generalizes. And now you also have the notion of a weighted degree and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, with this, I will finish here and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. So you presented these two methods for community detection. Um, where, how would you recommend picking between the two? Great. How would I recommend <laughs> picking between the two? Wow, I have a new camera. It never turned on before. So, um, so um, two things. If you are interested in something that's local to your seed node, you would use the first method. Because the first method will very quickly allow you to find a cluster for one node. The second method will give you this more hierarchical grouping of the entire network. So it depends. If you just care about the node and the local neighborhood around it, you would run the first method. If you more care about the global composition of these clusters, you would run the second method. Good question. Great. Um, anything else? Right? So. One more thing I say before you guys think of the second question is you could also use the first method to do clustering where you'd pick a node, find the cluster, remove that cluster from the network, pick the second node and keep doing that. But that would be kind of more heuristic. It wouldn't give, tell you much about the structure. Here you get this hierarchical decomposition for free. Good, have you guys thought of the second question? Good, okay, so if no questions, um, think of one for, for Thursday and I'll see you then. Um, thank you very much.